In the last video, we saw that the projection behavior of one-dimensional subsets of the plane depends on whether the set is regular or irregular, where regularity is defined in terms of whether the density, one density of the set exists almost everywhere or does not exist almost everywhere. As I promised, there is the uh, more modern version of stating those results, and that is through the notion of rectifiability. So what is a rectifiable set subset of a Euclidean space Rn? So n here is insignificant. It's just a large ambient space. Uh, so you could def really just define rectifiability for metric spaces, in fact. So we say that a subset of Rn is M rectifiable. So this is the, the notion being defined. If there exists um, Lipschitz maps f i from subsets of okay subsets of r m so this m rectifiability so you start with subsets in r m and then you map them into this ambient space and i is one and it can be countably many such that the set E, which is supposed to be M rectifiable, is basically contained in the images of these functions. So if I is the function defined on AI, so this is a subset of Rn, and when you take this union over I, and E is basically contained in it. That is in measure language. The part that is not included has negligible measure and again, uh, HM here. So that is definition of an M rectifiable subset of our N. Some quick observations that I don't even bother writing down is that if you just toss in a countable set into a into an M rectifiable set, you still have an M rectifiable set because the countable set can, does. we don't even need to cover that by these images. Um, it has measure zero. Similarly, if you remove a countable set, then it is still M rectifiable. Um, in general, the idea of M rectifiability is to generalize the notion of M dimensional smooth submanifolds. So in this case, for example, if you have a nice smooth manifold two-dimensional sitting inside R3, then this will be a two rectifiable set. But of course, countable union of such objects with possible self-intersections is still M rectifiable. Um, so it's kind of measured theoretically as nice as manifolds, but Geomet, I mean, just from subset or point of view, they can be quite messy. There are examples in, in books, uh, for example, I think by Simon's book, where there are uh, infinite bicycles drawn uh, with accumulation points. So, I mean, measure zero sets can be nasty, especially if M is large, it's difficult to even draw, but, uh, a lot of calculus and analysis can be done on these objects because measured theoretically they are uh, C, C1 submanifolds. There's precise also a statement that a rectifiable set is, if you toss out a set of measure zero, it's countable union of C1 manifolds. And that, that is easy to prove once you know that Lipschitz maps can be uh, 
approximated by C1 maps on a large part of their domain. And approximated, I mean, their domain is approximated, but the F itself completely agrees with the C1 function on a big portion of this, uh, this subdomain of this. Um, that was uh, covered in area formula series. There is a video there if you are interested to, to find that. Okay, so what is, these are the nice m-dimensional objects inside our n. What is the other end of the spectrum? What are the worst m-dimensional subsets? So these are the ones that, that just hate to have anything to do with uh, rectifiable sets. So we say a set E under our n is purely M on rectifiable. It's also good to warn you that in some text, for example, in Federer, which is the main uh, reference for these, the definitions are a little bit different. So it's a good idea to always double check the precise definition in every book. So is purely amen M unrectifiable if they just don't want to see any rectifiable sets. So if E intersection with E prime has zero M dimensional measure, measure for every M rectifiable from previous definition set E prime. So if you intersect it with some M rectifiable set, the intersection will have zero measure. Uh, in particular, for example, it will intersect every smooth M manifold on a set of measures zero. If we are, uh, so let's, let's give this example of the four corner counter set in R2. Um, so you had the four corners and then out of four corners you did the four corners and this goes of course at infinitum so this set is actually purely one unrectifiable so the counter four corner set is purely one unrectifiable of course i'm not proving this but it will for example follow from the theorem that we will have um, as a consequence for example this means that this set intersected with any uh, smooth curve will have zero h1 measure so for every um, we can even say Lipschitz curve because Lipschitz curves are definitely one rectifiable sets by definition. Okay, I know. So for every Lipschitz curve that you run, um, it will it cannot capture any subset of this four corner counter set with positive measure. Um, that that's quite interesting because we don't even say that gamma have finite length it could have infinite length but um, but the idea is that any finite portion of it cannot run through many points in counter set because they are so dispersed that if you pick one and then you pick another one you have to move some distance and then if you want to come back and pick another one that, that just builds up. So that means it's not even union, countable union of uh, sets with finite length. But we know that curves are definitely, even if they have infinite length, they are union, countable union of parts with um, finite length. But but anyway, that, that's just heuristics. So what is our uh, amazing theorem due to Besikovic and Federer? That theorem says that gives us if and only if conditions 
on rectifiability or pure on rectifiability. So let A sitting inside our N be H M measurable with We've seen this condition in many theorems and I have explained why this is um, essentially necessary condition. So with finite HM measure, the first part identifies rectifiable sets. So A, A is M rectifiable. So M is of course less than or equal to N. If and only if, so notice that this is an if and only if theorem, very strong. If um, projection of B, okay, so for this B, so projection of A onto Almost every, this has to be explained later, so onto almost every M dimensional affine subspace of Rn has zero H M measure. But then to be precise, we have to, this is not for, um, we have to replace A for every subset B of, so projection of B onto this has pos has zero, sorry, has positive because this is the H M measure for every B subset of A that is H measurable and H M of B is positive. Of course, you can take one point and this will not be true. So the last condition there. So if you take any subset of A with positive measure, a itself also included, um, then its projection onto affine subspaces will have positive measure. So this almost every m-dimensional affine subspace needs the notion of Grassmannians. So in dimension two, we were, we were uh, very comfortable with this notion of almost every direction because there was this natural identification of directions with just um, a segment of angles. So what are, how do you quantify, how do you talk about almost every two-dimensional surface? Suppose we want to talk about two, two rectifiability. So you, you want, you have to talk about projection onto almost every plane. So this is, for example, one plane and you have a set and you project onto this plane and you see something in the plane. Now, how many planes do you have? How does, what are all the possible um, copies of R2 sitting inside R3? And that set has been uh, given a manifold structure. It's even a group and uh, it's called the Grassmannian. So in this case, this will be the Grassmannian of two dimensional subspaces of R3. So this is a, a group, a manifold, and it has a measure, a natural measure on it. So when we say almost every um, affine subspace, that means with respect to that measure. So in, in one dimension, it, sitting inside R2, you're just safe continuing thinking about this. So for almost every theta. So even in R2, this is still a very important and non-trivial re result, easier to prove though than the general dimension. 
Um, but anyway, the, the claim is that a set is one rectifiable, for example, in R2, in the language of Falconer is regular set, if and only if its projection onto almost every line has positive measure. So it's the converse of the previous result we had seen that if your set is rectifiable, if your set is regular equivalently, then its projection on almost every direction has positive measure. This is saying that if, on the other hand, in the converse direction, if your projections have positive measure in almost every direction, then your set is actually M rectifiable. Okay, and then part two of the theorem regards the uh, pure unrectifiable T is purely M unrectifiable if and only if the projection of the set A in the affine subspace V has zero this time. Um, sorry. Zero HM measure for almost every V in this uh, Krasmanian of n-dimensional subspace m dimensional subspaces affine subspaces of rn so it's the same uh, meaning but here i'm using the notation so that means projection onto almo almost every m dimensional affine subspace will have zero hm measure so you will project but then you will see only a measure zero set um you should think what, how, how this theorem works when you have, because a, a general m-dimensional set will have an m-rectifiable part union a purely m-unrectifiable part. So in, in this case, neither, neither of these parts, um, in fact, is, is true because uh, if the purely un unrectifiable part had positive measure, you can choose it as your B, and uh, you will see from second part that actually this part that uh, the projection has positive measure phase, so that this will say that your set is not M rectifiable. On the other hand, a part two doesn't hold because the projection or actually pause the measure in that case because we have the rectifiable parts. So, um, so there is no contradiction there if you have a set which is union of a rectifiable part and a purely unrectifiable part. But um, the the beauty of this theorem is that if after we decompose a set into purely un unrectifiable and um, M rectifiable parts, you can detect this by just um, asking whether the projections have positive measure or zero measure in almost all directions. So that is the one of the, the f most fundamental theorems in geometric measure theory. Again, Beskovich Federer projection theorem. Um, The, the one topic of research, current and topic of research, is to say more about the exceptional sets in, in either scenario. So starting with, uh, for example, a rectifiable set. What are the bad directions? How big can this set of bad directions itself be? And hopefully I'll do some video on that soon.
Thank you so much for, for uh, watching to this part and have a great day.